Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever-blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and that sometimes messy thing we call life. This podcast is brought to you by Milu, the simplest way for photographers and coordinators to collaborate on shot lists and timelines for weddings, parties, and other amazing events. Visit Milu, M-I-I-L-U dot com. This podcast is also brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom image editing for the professional photographer. Visit photographersedit.com. Hey, Boca Podcast listeners, I have to jump in here really quick and just make a quick note. Uh, apparently, everything is quick. Quick note about the audio for this interview. We had a little bit of technical difficulty with the connection, the internet connection for the interview. So about halfway through, we switched from a web-based connection and conversation to a phone-based connection. And so some of those audio issues that you hear for the first half of the interview, they go away and it cleans up. Uh, I just wanted to let you know ahead of time. So as you begin to listen to that episode, just know that we're getting ready to fix it about halfway through the episode. Regardless, this is an amazing conversation with Chris Evans that I hope you are willing to just embrace and go apply. There's some really, really good stuff in it. Despite whatever audio issues, I hope that you enjoy this. Talk to you soon. All right, Boca Podcast listeners, thank you so much for joining me for another episode and a brand new guest and a a relatively new topic too. I don't think we've quite approached it from this angle before, but I have with me Chris Evans. Chris, thanks so much for making time for the Boca Podcast. Oh, my pleasure, Nathan. Thanks so much for having me. Well, and we were chatting a little bit before we hit the record button here. And, you know, I keep saying this, but I think at some point we need to create like additional segment of content that we're offering to our listeners or maybe some of our premium listeners. They can listen into the the conversation going on behind the scenes. But we're going to touch today on a topic, which is strategic relationships for the sake of growing a wedding photography business. I know that for me personally, as a wedding photographer, and I shot weddings for over 10 years, in the Chattanooga market, the relation, there was actually a key relationship that drove much of the business that we had. And I've said before in the podcast that I think that really the majority, or much of the time anyway, that photographers spend in their so-called work week should be focused on developing relationships. We're going to get your take on that topic here in just a little bit. But first of all, I have to give at least a brief introduction. I don't always do a great job of this with our guests. We've had so many, and I tend to just jump right into conversation. But you are a wedding photographer, and I'll go ahead and just share your Instagram is Chris J. Evans Photo, just like it sounds on Instagram. We'll put this in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. You're a wedding photographer based in maybe a combination, shall we say, of Hawaii and Santa Barbara. Where do you usually live? Yeah, so I'm based uh, full-time in Maui. I've been here for 10 years, and the uh, the last two years, I've been breaking more of the Santa Barbara market. And uh, it's just, it's an incredible place to shoot. And that's actually where I got married. So it's really special oh, place man. in my heart. Well, I haven't been to Maui specifically. I've spent a little bit of time in Hawaii, uh, Oahu, and I took my kids there actually a couple of years ago. And it was an amazing experience. Santa Barbara, I've been countless times, um, thanks to the photography industry. And uh, it is absolutely stunning. It's, it'd be in some ways kind of hard to pick probably where to shoot. But I noticed something on your Instagram account. We mentioned that a second ago that I want to just jump into before I start asking some questions here. And that is to do with the highlight that you have called Unplug. And I clicked on that and it actually is video of you standing in front of the guests, I guess, before the wedding ceremony starts. And, and you're literally announcing to them the significance of the unplugged ceremony. Is this something that the client had you do or do you just do this while with all of your clients? Yeah. So, you know, this started out of um, a couple of reasons. <laughs> Every wedding photographer out there, I'm sure, can relate to this one. You know, it, it's such an inconvenience when we have so many guests out there pull out their phones or their cameras and they lose sight of like of being present and being in the moment yeah. and why they're there. You know? And, um, you know, so for me, what I do is before the, the ceremony, I just ask the guests, I was like, hey, with your guys blessing, I'd love to just ask all the guests to be here and present with us and experience the ceremony in our hearts and in our souls and with our own eyes and not staring through our tiny screens. And they're always like, oh my God, that's such a good idea. Like, like, yes, please. So 
over the time, I've just developed like this great monologue where it also gives me a moment too, where I go up pre-ceremony, I introduce myself and the guys on my team, all the guests there. And it doesn't matter if it's 20 people or 150 people, Okay, you know, I'm just express like the gratitude that we're here for the day to celebrate for the couple. And then I just kind of go through my little monologue and everyone, I get like round of applause a lot of times. And then, um, I just tell them too afterwards, you know, find me or one of my guys. We want to take great pictures of you and, and your dates and your families and all that. So it also starts building relationships with each and every guest there right off the gate. Interesting. Okay. So first of all, are you, are your clients, do they know that you're going to do this ahead of time or is this just something you've taken the initiative to do? Yeah. So I asked them, like, I'll ask the bride right before, like right when I leave her getting ready session yeah. and I'm, I'm, okay, I'm going to go get in position. Um, oh, with your blessing, you want me to save my little monologue to all the guests just so everyone can be present and not be on their phones. And they're like, yes, every single time. Wow. That's really great. Okay. So I'm looking at that video and I, I mean, call me a rebel or whatever you want to label me, but I know that if somebody just stood up randomly in front of me and the, the fellow guests there at a wedding ceremony or any event really, and started telling me th- what to do with my phone, I'm not sure how well I'd respond to that, but you're saying that the the response is usually quite positive. It's really positive for sure. And you know, it's really all about presentation. Okay. You know, so I'll just go through it really quick. It's Hello, everybody. Welcome to Bill and Susie's wedding. We're so happy that we're all here. It's so important for them that we can all be 100% present and in this moment with them. And they really want to see your faces and they don't want to see your faces hiding behind your phones, or your cameras. So mm. let's just be 100% present and feel this in our soul and in our heart and totally be here for them because that's what it's all about. Afterwards, take as many pictures as you want. But during the ceremony, let us just do our job and it's going to be a great day. And it it's like simple as that. Yeah. Oh, I love it. It's short it's to the point. It sounds friendly. I think this is a really interesting idea and maybe more of us should should uh, take your lead here. This is a great example. Cool. Well, for those of you listening in, make sure that you go to Chris's Instagram. Again, it's Chris J. Evans photo. And uh, you can look at that highlight. It's called Unplug and actually see this in action. It's pretty cool. Let me jump into our questions though for the day. And we normally start off with a question about brand position. And I'm curious, I mean, you're, you're based in Hawaii, which is like the Mecca of weddings, or at least one of them. And then Santa Barbara, same thing. How do you set your business apart from the other wedding photographers? What's your brand position? For sure. So, you know, I, I come from the fashion and editorial world. That's what I shot before weddings. And so everything that I had built up until that point was all just based on like style and just how like, how I can market myself to luxury brands in order to get business and luxury magazines and things of that nature. So when I fell into weddings, you know, I, this was in 2012 was when I did my first one. And, you know, as I was looking around at all the other wedding photographers, I saw like everybody had like this cursive wispy font. Everybody (laughs) had, everybody had these flowers in their logos. Everyone like everything just looks so homogenized, Yeah, you know? And like the work was all like, it was all pretty. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying anything negative. I'm saying everything was pretty. Everything was classic. Everything was just seemed safe, you know? And for me, you know, I like, I always came out of when I'm shooting a story for a magazine or shooting an ad for a client, you know, I want to make things really rad and really pop. You know, I also come from the extreme sports world. I used to surf competitively and do skateboard contests when I was younger. So for me, like this little bit of edge is what I sort of brought into my weddings. And my very first client was um, a dear friend of ours. And I'd done modeling photos for her in the past. So she was gorgeous. My wife was one of the bridesmaids. My daughter was a flower girl. You know, so she asked me to shoot her wedding. At first, I was reluctant. And she basically forced me. I'm like, okay, fine. She's like, just shoot it like a fashion story. So, okay, I will. So I kind of fell into it like that. Okay. And I had never shot a wedding, never assisted a wedding photographer or anything like that. So I just, I shot it like this editorial vibe and it just sort of took off from there. Well, and I get that, that look and feel is, I mean, it's consistent with what you're saying. If you go to the website and again, for those of you listening in, chrisjevans.com, just like it sounds, and we'll push that in the, uh, the show notes as well, but it does have that editorial feel. And you know, there is, there is, there are some photographers, I guess, that have tried to take that fashion approach. It was something that kind of hit pretty strong. I think maybe even a few years ago, almost came and went. And now we've moved on to something else or two or three other styles that are really popular. But I love the, the first of all, the classic nature of the f- photographic style. And you can see this on your site and on Instagram as well. And it's a style that isn't 
you know, people aren't going to look at in five, 10 years and say, oh my goodness, what in the world was that guy thinking? That's number one. And then two, that editorial look and feel kind of carries over into the way that the website is laid out. It's designed. It's a font that is very easy to read, navigation that's very easy to follow. And uh, I think that really makes a big difference too, as opposed to like you're saying, this kind of cutesy, touchy-feely approach, which in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with. But I think some photographers can kind of get carried away in that process and then lose sight of what that means to the client experience when they're actually engaging with them. And then the style of photography, what does that mean five, 10 years down the road when you have this really dark and moody image that is going to print pretty terribly likely. And in five or 10 years, that client's looking at the image and saying, what were we doing? No, for, for sure. You know, and when I was, you know, developing my brand and, and once like, you know, in the beginning, you know, I thought I needed to be like a wedding photographer. So that was like, I was like trying to like get all my research from then. And then when I was like, when I really honed in on who, who do I exactly want to be? And like, what, who's my brand for? And what's my, who's my ideal client? Uh, that's when everything really, like, that's when everything really fast tracked, you know, that's when my, you know, I took more of a fashion label font for my logo. Um, I wanted to make things really simple. You know, for me, I grew up, you know, my mom's a couture wedding dress designer or was during the eighties was really, really big time. So I grew up in that whole world. Like my youngest memories are beautiful women in wedding dresses. So it's kind of built into my DNA. Yeah. So for me, I just started marketing it as this, like my, my, my tagline is where fashion, nature and weddings collide. And, and I feel like that really sums up who I am and what I, what I want to bring to the table. Um, and listening to some, some of your other listeners, I loved your episode with a uh, cheers name. I can't remember her name, but how she said, you know, people are going to get to my site and some aren't going to resonate with me. And that's, that's perfect, you know, cause I don't want, you know, I, I want to have a very, the more connected my clients are to my work and to my brand and to me, the better our whole experience is going to be. So I want to tailor everything towards my ideal client. So you mentioned Cheers Babe photo, and this was actually episode 186 with Jess Anesto, and we'll link to that episode in the in the uh, show notes at bocapodcast.com. But I, I want to jump back really quickly, Chris, to the, to the point that you made or the points that you made, the questions that you were asking yourself when it came to how to go about building the look and feel of your brand. You were, you were basing those decisions on the type of business that you were wanting to run, the type of client that you wanted to interact with. And you asked those questions first, you, d- you decided on the answers for yourself, and then you designed the look and feel of your brand and ultimately the photography as well. And I think that order is, and, and an approach is a really intelligent one to take and is a great example for our listeners. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. And again, we'll link to that, uh, that episode 186 with Jess in the podcast show notes as well. By the way, for those of you listening in, Boca, B-O-K-E-H, podcast.com. That's where you can find the show notes. And they're pretty detailed. Haley, thanks to Haley for putting those very detailed show notes together for each of the episodes. And you can kind of follow along, look at the talking points, link to the resources that we discuss. Definitely take advantage of those. Chris, talk to me about maybe one of the most important lessons that you've learned as a photography business owner so far. What comes to mind? For sure. So, you know, photography wedding photography in particular it's one of those things where you're walking into a, an event where there's going to be 150 people you've never met anyone in your life and for me since i service mostly destination clients i don't even meet my clients till the day of their wedding so for me my unique challenge is how do i establish myself as this trusted confidant and a 20 year friend and like everyone's there like they're they're just a really calm an amazing presence in as quickly in as, the shortest amount of time possible. So I think one of the most important things for wedding photographers is that ability to walk into a room, introduce yourself, be confident, and just set the clients at ease and everyone in your anyone who you're going to be photographing at total ease, so they can just be themselves, and relax, and not feel like a either a looming presence or maybe like a a nervous presence. Like we set the stage for how like really the tone of the entire event goes because they're going to spend the most time with us than anybody else in their whole wedding day. Yeah, that's great. And there are a couple of things that come to mind here. One, when you talk about setting the tone, this is something on a very personal level that I've been thinking about and, and really want to, to make 
more of an effort in in my personal life and just the way that I interact with my kids or my girlfriend or you know family members or otherwise that that first interaction it's funny even with people that you've spent you know hours and hours and hours of time with that first interaction when they see you at the end of the day or they see you for a weekend event or whatever it might be that really can set the tone for the conversation it can set the tone for the time that you're going to spend together and I, I just love that reminder on a personal level that really it's on us going into a situation rather than being very reactive and, and wondering how the other person is going to engage with us, that we set the tone and understand that the majority of cases, if we set the tone and are consistent with that and engage them, that it'll make all the difference in the world in the way that they then respond to us. So that's a huge piece of advice and a great reminder. The other thing that you mentioned, though, is the significance of confidence. And I know that a lot of photographers struggle with this, particularly referring to themselves as introverts or introverted, not being comfortable in groups of people they're not familiar with. Are there any particular tips or techniques, practices that you have implemented to do a better job being confident when you're engaging with these groups of people? For sure. You know, first off, I just Full disclaimer, I'm a hopeless people person. <laughs> I, I I love making new friends. Like I can go out surfing and I'm gonna come home with a new surf buddy. Like I'm just I'm that's just my innate personality. So that's a lot awesome. of this kind of comes deep for me. But I think some some strategies are just, you know, on in in relation to the actual wedding day, I break it down so simple. They want photos, we've got the camera. So right there it should kickstart a sense of confidence that you're there for a reason. They've already, they like your work. They've seen for all the reasons they hire you. So for me, the first thing I do is I show up at the wedding. I walk in to meet the couple or they're, they're separated. So I'll walk in to meet the bride. I never have a camera in my hand at first. And I just, I want to introduce myself. Happy wedding day. You look amazing. We're going to have so much fun today. I'll be back shortly to get things started. And just that simple kickstart creates this really organic, calm dialogue where she's like, oh, this is awesome. He's so nice. It was so easy. And she's at ease. She can just be. So then when I come back in with my cameras, she's like, we're already have this easy rapport. And it's the same thing with the groom. You know, I go upstairs. How's it going, Bill? So nice to meet you. This is my team. And usually my second shooter is running the guys program. So I'm like, this is my second shooter. He's going to be taking good care of you guys. If you need anything, just let me know. We're here for you. And again, it just sets the tone. They know that I'm confident in my craft and my ability to perform for them on that day. And I've just established this very easing presence and we can build on that throughout the day. That's great. And that you're, you're consistent in your message of proactivity, taking the initiative, setting the tone, setting the stage. And for those of you who are uncomfortable or have those introverted tendencies and feel uncomfortable going into a situation where you don't know somebody or group of people, a lot of times it's it's about just doing and the feelings will come because, and again, 90, 95% of cases, the person or the people that you're engaging with, with that type of tone, that kindness and genuine interest in them and taking care of them, that is going to come back. They will respond really, and in a really positive way, they'll respond extremely positively to that type of interaction, that type of engagement. But if you set the tone, that's the type of interaction you can have for the day. And so again, this is a really great reminder. I appreciate you sharing sharing that, Chris. Talk to me about time. We're going to kind of shift gears here. You have a family yeah. and it, just even just as an individual, creating time for yourself outside of the computer, sitting in front of the computer, getting work done. How do you go about that? Is there anything that you do in particular through the week that enables you to have time for yourself and for your family? Definitely. So, you know, I learned with my first child that it's all about routine. Yeah. (laughs) The, The routine is key. So without trying to sound like monotonous and like a robot, you know, basically I run through sort of the same routine day in and day out. And this is what works best for us. So basically wake up in the morning, get the kids ready for school. If it's during the school year, we're gonna, I'm going to usually make breakfast, get their lunches packed. My wife's getting them ready, brushing their hair, get all that good stuff. Kids go off to school. Then I go to the gym. That's the first thing I do. I either go to the gym or go surf. And I'll come back. I'll do my emails. I sit down and I'll get, get to my editing workflow, um, which I'll talk more about my flow later, but I'll get to my editing take a little break for lunch, spend some time with my wife if she has time off in that particular day. And then I work until about four or five, usually never past five because then the kids are back. I want to start making dinner and then um, put them down. And then once they're asleep, hang out with my wife. And that's sort of our 
day in, day out. If I've got a lot of work to do, sometimes I'll work a little bit extra um, after the kids go to sleep, but I try not to pass five. Yeah, consistency and routine. And I, I go back to the word consistency because this is something that I'm working on personally right now. Consistency is really important and, and it sets expectations for your wife. It sets expectations for the kids. And I remember we were actually talking about our kids before we started recording. My kids are 17 and 14 now, but um, what something that we used to do back in the day was something we referred to as fun sun or actually fun Monday is what we started with when they when school started up, then it was fun Sunday. But there was this expectation that was created for them as young kids that mom and dad are going to shut the computers down. They're not going to be doing work. They're getting going to engage with us. And that was something that we would do consistently. And that expectation was set. They could look forward to it. And it also created a certain amount of accountability for us as well. And I, I think there is something to be said for the consistency and day in, day out, having those routines, because it does create expectations. It does create accountability and stability. I mean, as human beings, we we seem to crave that as well. So I think it just feels good to, to know what's going to happen next. And uh, I also have to say, I love that you start out with exercise at the beginning of the day. Does that, what does that do for you mentally or physically or both when it comes to then diving into work? So, you know, I was, um, I've always been active. Like I said, I grew up in the extreme sports world, um, but I was never really like a gym person. And it was last year I decided that I was going to get really serious and like get a trainer and like get in shape and, and put this le- level of discipline in my life. I've been very work disciplined, but I hadn't been very like super personal discipline on that level. Uh, you could usually find me eating ice cream at midnight. You know, <laughs> a lot of- so I decided it was the time I got into it. It totally changed like all my habits and all my brain waves. So now when I, I get to the gym in the morning, I do my thing. It's hard. I, I sweat. You know, I really like, I put so much effort into it. After that, every other obstacle or challenge or just anything I need to get finished in my business life seems so much easier. So it actually sets my mind on this mental track where, you know, I feel healthy and strong and nourished. And then all my challenges for work are really like so much simpler. Whereas maybe like two years ago, if something wasn't right, I could like, you know, be pulling my hair out and stressing out. Now it's like, no worries. I got this. There's six other ways I can solve this. So it's really given me this like mental calmness. Yeah. 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 That's really good. That's good. And and again, the routine, the consistency there is important too. And that you, you know, that's the thing you're going to do first thing in the day, your body gets used to that. Um, and it really does something for, I mean, there's a hormonal response to, to at least certain types of exercise and an endorphin response, even especially de- dependent on the, the amount of time that we put in or maybe the effort. And, and then you set the stage for the level of discipline, which then can translate to work. I, I love this. This is really, really good stuff. Talk to me about a book. Maybe this is an audio book or you like to read a physical book or Kindle or whatever it might be, but what's the most impactful self-help or business book that you've read or listened to recently? I'm an Audible fanatic. I'm always I'm traveling so much lately, so I'm always listening to, to Audible audiobook books. There's three right now that are really like I sort of call them like my trinity. Yeah. Right now, uh, the first one is, is "Leaders Eat Last" by Simon Sinek. Yes. Um, it's an incredible read. It's it's all about like ex paramilitary guys and strategies of like leading your team and just being a good leader. And you know, it really dives into a lot of um. A lot of the references are sort of like to combat, which it's a little extreme, but you know, the art of business is very similar to the art of war, which is my other book by Sun Tzu, The Art of War for My Strategy. Yeah. So Leaders Eat Last, my leadership skills. The my strategy comes from the art of war. And I'm just finished um The Power of Broke by Damon John from Shark Tank. Really? And okay. That, and that is all about hustle. He talks about in the power of broke how you know, when you're, when you're starting out and you don't have, when you have nothing to lose and everything to gain, that's so such a driving force. And if you know that if you don't make this happen, you're not going to put food on the table for your kids. That's a driving force. If you don't make this happen, you're not going to be able to keep yourself warm at night or have a roof over your head. That's powerful stuff. So those three books right now are like my holy trinity of leadership, hustle, and strategy. Wow. Okay. Now you talk about the, the Holy Trinity, these, these books, are, are you listening to them kind of on repeat, just going back to the concepts and principles in those? Yeah. So, you know, I go through like one at a time and then like, I just sort of like, I'll go back and I'm always looking for new ones, but, but like, those are just the last three right now that I just are really like, are 
that I try to use those as my case studies and my models for how I interact with my team and my clients, my business. That's really good though. And this is, um, I don't know, maybe a little bit of confirmation bias for me, but I, something that I've been actually doing as of late is consuming, um, or working toward consuming less content. And this also includes books. I mean, I have a, a pretty big library of, of Kindle books, audible books as well. And I've read quite a bit over the years, but I also find that from those books that I've read or consumed, I have so much that I could take and do with that information that's been shared with me that could probably really stand the test of time, essentially, at least as long as I'm alive, I have enough to do with those principles that I don't need to, quote, need to take in additional content, at least not for the time being. Because what I found was that continuing to take in more and more information in various formats, including books, was... I, my my brain's just getting crowded because on top of that, I'm also working with the team and, and now multiple brands and it, it can get a little bit crowded in there, a little bit convoluted in there. So I'm trying to, to do oh, certain yeah. things to kind of quiet my mind. And one of those things is to minimize the amount of content. And I like this approach maybe of, you know what, instead of trying to take in a hundred books in a year or whatever these numbers that people will throw out, maybe just focus on a, a limited amount of content and really truly applying that information versus taking it in and saying, oh, that was nice and going on to the next thing. I really like that. No, for sure. Because then it's like, then you get to like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the type of learner where I need to like feel it, taste it, touch it, do it to know it like truly. So for me, you know, maybe it's like this year, it's just these three books. Next year, it might be three more. You know, because like you said, you know, like when I go to a wedding, I try to memorize as many people's names as possible. So at the end of the day, I barely even remember my own name. <laughs> so it's just really like directed, like what is really going to be the most important things to me and my business and, and my day to day operations. And so maybe it's like three books a year. Maybe that's the magic number. I'm not sure. That's cool. I love it. All right, so let's shift gears yet again, and let's talk just briefly about photography. Uh, this is what you do after all. Talk to me about one of the most unusual items in your camera bag that enables you to be a better photographer. This doesn't have to be a camera, a lens, a flash. We've had some pretty interesting things here, but what, what comes to mind? For sure. So I've got a couple of things. Um, I have this really great styling kit that I bring for my bridal details. And first off, I got to describe the bag because my whole brand is fashion forward. So I got this beautiful, big gray suede shoulder bag. And in there, I've got vintage lace veils. I've got different hand dyed silk ribbons. I've wow. got some prisms for some cool kind of artsy things. I've got vintage stamps. I've got a dress hanger, just a beautiful vintage dress hanger in case the bride doesn't bring a cool one because I can't shoot a dress on like a plastic hanger. Um, and then I've got a deck of cards sometimes for the groom shots, like maybe they just want to play some cards or even for a photo op, you know, a couple aces up their sleeve always looks kind of cool. <laughs> That's really cool. Okay. Well, I have to go back to the bag first. What is the, the brand of the bag that you're carrying? I think it's like Kenneth Cole or something. I don't know. I got it from Macy's. It's just, a, just a stylish kind of like duffel bag over the shoulder kind of thing. But yeah. over my Pelican case, it just looks cool as I'm rolling through the hotels. <laughs> That's awesome. And then coming prepared with almost, I guess, what would be akin to to props uh, that you can pull out and use in various scenarios, I think is great. Just that extra level of preparation. That's really, really cool. So do you, is this something that you carry with you to every single wedding that you go to? Yeah, every single wedding for sure. That bag's always with me. Sometimes like for my higher end weddings, like my wedding planners, they'll they'll do they'll direct like the flat lays. So sometimes it's already set up. Okay. Other times like I'll just be in the room and she pulls out her invitation and her shoes. I'm like, okay, cool. Well, I'm looking around the room, but there's nothing like really great surface wise. I can just throw down my vintage lace and stack up the invitations on there and use some ribbons and I've got a beautiful flat lay that otherwise I would just be shooting in like a plain or not that interesting backdrop. Yeah, you know, that's as much as there is something to be said for creativity and using what's there on site. Sometimes you just end up in, in some not so ideal scenarios and being able to have those props along with you to create those images, those beautiful images, I think is a, a really, really great idea. So great point of reference for our listeners. Thanks for sharing that. And, and let's actually just go ahead and jump right into what is really our primary focus for today's conversation, which has to do with really a theme at this point, relationships, but more specifically strategic relationships uh, with those people, those vendors more specifically, that will help us build our business. 
And I alluded to this at the beginning of the, ep- the episode as well, but I really think that a lot of the time that photographers should be spent working, as much as it's easy to get caught up in you know, Facebook and Instagram and kind of working away at, at bringing that email inbox down to zero or whatever the thing may be, instead of a lot of that busy work that actually doesn't have that much of an impact on our business, we should be focusing on relationships. So I'm curious, with this being a focus of yours, what, what percentage of your week roughly do you spend on those very relationships? That's a really good one for sure. Um, is a percentage, is, it's a lot. You know, I mean, if we take into account, because I do all my own Instagramming and social media. So if we just start with every time I do an Instagram post and I'm tagging every vendor, I'm tagging the venue, I'm tagging the dress designer, the cake maker, the caterer, I'm tagging every single person who was part of that couple's special day. So right there, that's definitely a form of relationship building, tagging, giving credit, Posting, I post probably tw- anywhere from 10 to sometimes like 20 images a week. Wow. So right there, that's a that's a large percentage of, of networking and relationship building just through there. Um, also through Instagram, I'll, when I'm spending time reaching out to new planners and new markets, I see someone whose work I admire. I start the conversation. Hey, I love your work. Beautiful stuff. Never had the hard ask off the beginning. It's always like... Love your events. Your everything looks beautiful. Great style, Chris. And then if I get a response, then I start building a relationship from there. That's just sort of like that. That's like the social sphere of networking and of relationship building. On my personal side, you know, once a week I like to just shoot emails to my planners, my planners I work with mostly. Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're having a great week. Looking forward to our next job together. Even if I don't have anything booked for months. You know, I don't have anything even booked at all for that year with them, even if I have something booked at the end of the week. It's just like, hey, guys, happy Monday. Have a great week. We'll talk soon. So just like those little things where I'm just like caring about, you know, because I don't look at them as just relationships, as just planners. Like I want to build lasting friendships that, yes. that go beyond just a transactional relationship. Yeah. And, and, you know, as cliche as that may sound, I I'm a hundred percent with you. I think there is so much, per- I mean, maybe this is selfish, but there's so much personal benefit too to actually having genuine relationships with these vendors that we're working with that sure is going to bring, they're going to bring us business, but to actually have a friendship with them, there is so much greater benefit from that type of relationship than something that we're just going into trying to get something from the other person and then leaving. I, investing in an actual relationship yeah. is huge. So I, I love that that is an emphasis for you. And, and you know, I, I mentioned um, Instagram kind of in passing earlier. I certainly don't want to minimize the significance of that. And you, you pointed out the very reason why we shouldn't. I mean, that so much of developing those relationships, the working relationships, is posting these vendors' work, giving them credit, giving them the shout out, giving them exposure. And that really does play a, a big role. Um, and then I tend to kind of lean toward the significance too of those in-person connections, phone calls. And I know we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail here in just a little bit, but I was just curious to get your take on the amount of time. Now you said you do all of your own social media and you seem to have a well-established business. Is there a particular reason for doing that yourself versus hiring somebody else or having somebody on your team do that for you? I like it. <laughs> um, That's cool. I think it's fun. I like, I like scrolling through Instagram. I like posting my my images that I wanted because you know because I'm I've created such a direct vision for like myself and my brand that I just I know exactly what it is that I want to show and what I want to say at all times. So for me, it just it makes the most sense for me to do it myself. Um, my wife does help me with some Pinterest stuff, and she's become really good at that. But as far as like the Instagram goes, and and just to to finish up touching on that relationship building part is once I post those images. Every one of those clients is going to repost them and repost them. All those vendors, I mean, they're all going to repost them. So I can have one image post myself, get reposted 12, 15 times to all their different channels. Um, You know, so they get excited about it. I get excited. Their audience sees it. My audience sees it. And just, you know, the rule of seven, people sort of need to see something seven times before they remember it. Um, All goes into play. Um, Another thing I've been doing too, which is really great is, at, at the end of like the sunset photo session with all my clients, I get a picture of me and the clients together. I'll have my assistant take it. Okay. And then I'll post my gratitude post about them. It's thank you so much. I usually just use their initials. Your wedding at so-and-so venue was amazing. All the best. Thank you. And then I tag again, all the vendors. So then all the vendors share that thank you post. 
and that source of gratitude. And this happens to be me in the photo with my couples. So again, it's just building this rapport and this relationship that I have with my clients that's so special to me. Yeah, you mentioned gratitude. I mean, and, and this is also something we'll touch on here in just a little bit. But I love, again, the the emphasis on something that goes beyond just your ego and your work, but actually showing gratitude to your clients, those you work with that are bringing you and your company this value. I think that's so important. It's also something that I want to be even more cognizant of in my personal life as well as my business. And, and I love that you set that example for us. Let's talk then about the types of relationships here. Now, you mentioned your clients, but a lot of this growth or business growth comes from the strategic relationships with those that are not clients. What are the top three relationships that come to mind for you that have played a, a significant ro- role in growing your business? Well, I'm going to just first give a shout out to Robin Iea. She is the founder and editor of Pacific Weddings Magazine. And very early in my career, like I had moved to Maui, I'd fallen into weddings, and I'd only done like, I'd done maybe three weddings to that point. I was so, I was as green as it possibly gets, but I had a large portfolio of my fashion work. I'd been a working photographer. I just never done weddings before. Sure. Um, so I found out that she was based on Maui. And I just sent an email blind, just, you know, I had nothing to lose back to that power broke mentality. I had nothing to lose. I was waiting tables and I was like, okay, I'm just going to shoot this editor an email. Hey, how's it going? My name's Chris Evans. I'm new to the Maui. I'm trying to get into weddings. I'd love to take you out for lunch and just see what, see what, see if we can work together in any capacity. And she was like, she emailed me back, like, I think maybe even within the day, if not the next day, she's like, I'd love to meet you. Sounds great. We met up for lunch and we just started to build this relationship. And I had mentioned to her that I really wanted to work at this particular venue. And she was like, hold on a minute. She calls the venue right then and there and says, I'm sitting with this new photographer. He's really amazing. You've got to meet him. And that right there was like the first, just like, you know, in surfing, when you surf big waves, there's the toe-ins on the jet skis where it helps you get to the wave. Like that was a toe-in for me all the way. Oh, I love that analogy. That's really cool. With this relationship, I mean, what was... The fact that she was willing to just kind of jump in with you is really huge, especially like you said, as as a new photographer. What do you think was, or has she even talked about the motivation in that? Or was there something that you had done to set the tone to encourage that type of relationship from the get go? For sure. So, you know, so, you know, I was, I'm, I'm, I was so eager, you know, I was like, I knew this is what I wanted to do. I had a really clear vision even then of like who I was and like, and where I wanted to, to take um, take my craft, kind of where I was going to position myself in the industry. And, you know, I think we just connected on that level of like design and like wanting to be different and not wanting to like just put the same stuff out, you know, and I was ready, willing and able to do the work. And again, coming at it so humble, like I had, you know, I had only had shot three weddings. And I was like, <laughs> you know, there's so many lessons to be learned yet that I hadn't even learned and even knew about. And, you know, I just think we connected on this level of like entrepreneurship and art and fashion and all these things that, you know, I think we just sort of were, we're just, we're at the vibrating at the same wavelength yeah. and she just wanted to, to help me out. Oh, that's lovely. And, but I love again, that you still acknowledge that and you show that gratitude. I think that's really important that we main, we all maintain that mentality and approach to these relationships. Talk to me about some, some of the other key relationships. Yeah. So the next one is the perfect segue because the woman she called (laughs) was this woman, Sylvia. She owns the famous Haiku Mill on Maui. And I don't know if you've looked at that place. This photo is all over my website. But the Haiku Mill is just this incredible old sugar mill on Maui that basically looks like this Tuscan Italian secret garden villa that she's completely restored into like, they call it, um, it's like a European luxury, like, old world Europe. It's amazing. It's the most enchanting venue I've ever shot at. Wow. So she called her up. That was who she called. I set up a meeting with her. I went in, showed her my work again, three weddings to my name, but I had a vision and I wanted to do something different. And again, it just it resonated with her and they threw me my first job. It was just an elopement there. That elopement ended up going on style me pretty, which was my very first publishing. And then that, once that happened, everything just fast tracked and every venue I called every planner I called when I said, Oh, I'm working at the haiku mill and I'm working with Robin from Pacific weddings magazine. Everyone was like, Oh yeah, for sure. Here you go. And I literally went from 
three weddings. So that first year I shot 12 and then I went to 30 and then 60. And the last two years I've shot over a hundred weddings each year. Oh man. Yeah. I think there was something that you had noted to us that you had shot 105 weddings this last year. I did, how do you maintain the energy yeah. to do that? That's incredible. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's, it's just going to work. It's like, you know, what's the schedule today? All right. We got another wedding today. Like last week I shot four, I shot four weddings last week. Wow. And you know, we just, we get up, we go to work and it's pretty amazing. Cause they're all, you know, very like, you know, they're all high end, uh, high end. And most of them are luxury weddings too. So and on Maui, we have weddings seven days a week here. So, I mean, it's just, it's wildfire. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I hadn't thought about that, how that, you know, here, especially with the weather kind of limited to certain time of the year and then maybe certain days of the year because everybody's scheduled, but yeah, they're coming there for the wedding. And I guess that could happen anytime. That's, that's wild. And that location, the Haiku Mill, for those of you curious, I mean, if you just Google it, you'll see stunning pictures, but go to Chris's Instagram. Uh, there's a post, let's see, July 13th of a kind of dining setup on the property there. That's absolutely gorgeous. Just stunning. Another picture on June 17th on his Instagram that you can see from that same location as well. It's absolutely gorgeous, but wow, this is, this is really, really neat. So Rob and Sylvia, and then is there another key connection that comes to mind? Um, yeah, I mean, the third one is just the relationships I've built with the blogs and magazine editors over time. And, you know, a lot of them I've never met in person. It's just been through emails and, you know, every time I would get a wedding published, I would find out who the publisher was and get a hold of their email. Again, send them a thank you email expressing my gratitude. And just over the time now, you know, I'll just get I'll get emails all the time from different blog and magazine editors. Hey, Chris, we're looking for beach beachy bouquets or we're looking for wedding weddings in the rain or like, you know, whatever it is. So now they're contacting me for content. So I'm able to send it out to them. And that's been a really huge strategic relationship in raising my brand awareness and putting it out there. Now, this is probably something I can imagine you've probably been asked this a million times, but naturally photographers are curious, how do you go about developing those relationships with those blog sites? I mean, cause it can be tough, right? It's a crowded industry. A lot of people trying to get their work published. Sure. How did you, how did you get into that? So, you know, I've, again, going back to the power of broke, I've, I never had anything to lose. So I would just shoot emails and just attach them on work. Hey, um, you know, Jill at whatever magazine, like this is, my name's Chris Evans. I'm from Maui. Um, here's some work I'm doing. I'd love to be on your radar. If my work doesn't fit your focus, that's all good. I totally get it. But if we can build the relationship together in any capacity, I'd love to. And, you know, sometimes I hear nothing. Sometimes I hear back, oh my gosh, your work's amazing. Let's uh, do an editorial together or let's do this. So Really just having, you know, again, being confident and not being afraid of, of not hearing back or hearing no and just keep chugging forward with your vision. And I just that's what's always worked for me. What, what do you think that is the, the fear of hearing no? Like, what is that? What does that do to us? And I'm, I'm, I'm asking this for myself, too, really. What does that do to us that makes us so uncomfortable that we might hear the response? No. And, and that actually keeps us from being proactive, taking the initiative, setting the tone the way that you so exemplified. What is that? You know what it is? I think we're all like, we're artists and we're so connected to our craft. And especially as photographers working with people, we know, and just from talking to you, I know you're very similar mentality as me, is we're so invested in our clients' happiness and the experience we're bringing to them. So like, you know, the few times if we have a client who isn't totally thrilled or happy, like we're crushed, you know, because we really, we poured everything we have yeah. into that client and into that day and into that art. So I feel like sometimes when you hear a no or maybe get like rejected for something or don't, or don't book that job that you wanted, you're like, oh man, is it me? Like, oh, like you really kind of beat yourself up. Whereas like my wife has been really instrumental in just helping me remember Every no, uh, every job you didn't book, leaves that date open for the next bigger, better, cooler job that's better for you. So for me, like just breaking it down like that has been really helpful. That's cool. And, you know, at the end of the day, it is so much of it is how we frame the situation. Right. And I like that your wife takes that again, that very proactive, positive approach, which is, hey, you know what? Yeah, sure. It's an it's an opportunity lost, maybe, but it just gives you the space to get something even cooler. 
And framing it that way sets the tone again. This has been a wonderful theme through our conversation today, Chris. Sets the tone for you to keep your head up, move forward, and then take advantage of the next opportunity that comes along. I think this is. Uh, I mean, we could stop the episode here, and I know personally, I've, I've already, I'm already been walking away inspired. So this is really cool stuff. But just before we finish up here, I'd love to to make it even more practical for our listeners. And, and you've actually yeah. already delved into this a little bit, but let's get really, really practical about certain ways that you go about not only developing these relationships, but furthering them, maintaining them even over time. Because just like any relationship in our personal life or professional life, we have to actually make the effort, right, to not only to, to initiate the relationship, but then develop the relationship and to, to further that relationship and maintain that relationship, keep it in a positive light. And you and I were actually chatting before we got started, and you were talking to me about some of these ideas, these activities, these things that you do in order to encourage those relationships. So I, we'll maybe play a little bit of word association here, and I'm just going to state the word that you mentioned to me before we got started. I would love to hear your thoughts on each of these. Uh, the first thing that you'd mentioned to me cool. was the idea of follow-up. What comes to mind when you hear the word, the phrase follow-up? Yeah. So follow up is such an important factor, you know, because we all we shoot an email out and then we go on to the four million trillion billion other things that we have going on in our life. Yep. So follow up with planners is perhaps if I sent them an introduction, if it's a new planner, you know, a week later, I'll send them a follow up. How's it going? Chris Evans is following up on our last interaction. Love to hear from you. Really simple. Someone I'm working with constantly, and maybe I just sent the gallery off to the planner or to the client. It's just, hey, how's it going? Um, just want to make sure you receive the gallery and we're able to access everything. Follow up, you know, it's taking initiative, caring that the work was delivered and received and and well received, obviously. And then, um, you know, just following up with with clients when you get emails from a potential client and you sent your response. If I don't hear anything in three days, I, fo- I send a follow-up within three days. Hey, um, Susan, how's it going? Just wanted to follow up on our last exchange about your upcoming wedding. Look forward to hearing from you soon. Very simple. Never like a hard ask again. I just want to like let them know that I am still remember them. Make sure they still remember me. That's really great. How do you keep up with that? Do you use a particular tool that reminds you to follow up or like a task manager of some kind? What does that look like? So I, I literally just flag the, all my inquiries that come in with a red flag and email. And then every three days, I go look for my flags and respond. Simple, simple enough. I love it. And that's practical and something that everybody listening can do right away. So that's, that makes it even better. Okay, so the next word or phrase, actually, in this case, networking events. Love networking. It's For me, it's one of the funnest part of the jobs. It's when we get to go out to different events and I get to see all my fellow frienders my vendor friends, I get to see everyone outside of a work environment. Everyone's eating good food, which we never get to eat like the tray pass at a wedding. So (laughs) get to see everyone just having a good time, enjoying themselves. And we get to really get to know each other even more so than just on a wedding day. Because on a wedding day, it's like, oh, hey, how's it going? Oh my gosh, your makeup looks so amazing. The makeup artist or the hair looks incredible. The flowers look incredible. But the networking events, hey, how's the kids? How's the family? How was that vacation you went on? What's exciting? What do you have going on? Like, you get to just really connect on the personal level. And for me, those networking events are priceless. Uh, I think you need to coin the term or, or patent the word frienders because the, the combination of friendship <laughs> and, and vendor relationship here is, is pretty perfect. But uh, interesting to me that you noted kind of asking the personal questions at the networking events, because I've had some experiences as a wedding photographer at networking events that honestly weren't the greatest. You go to these various networking events and it's... I don't know, there's a show that's being put on and, you know, some of the conversations or even a lot of the conversations go as far as maybe exchanging a business card, which is kind of that thing that you do. And it doesn't go beyond that. How do you encourage that personal interaction, that genuine interaction, the desire for actual friendship when you go to these networking events? For sure. You know, I think for me, I've learned to like really be good at reading wavelengths and different and different personality types. So most of us can tell, I I think most of us can tell within a few moments of talking to someone, whether or not we're sort of, I say this again, vibrating at the same frequency or not. Yeah. So like when the conversations really, when I meet someone new, Hey, I'm Chris, I'm from Maui, I'm a photographer. And they're like, Oh, Maui, Oh my gosh, amazing. And instantly we like their eyes light up and we have a connection. I know that someone that, that we're connecting on more than just, on just, we're just, we're just connecting. 
you know, other people, if like you try to start talking to them and you're just not feeling that connection, maybe they're not interested in you. Maybe they're looking around at who's over your shoulder. Like, okay, cool. Nice to meet you. And I just kind of move on. So I'm always like, I never get discouraged because again, I I just, I come back to the complete tunnel vision I have for my brand Mm. that you're either like, you you either get it and you like, you're into it or you're looking for something different, which is perfect, which is a hundred percent a okay. I just want to surround myself with people that are really kind of get me and my brand and what it is that I'm about. So I seek out those people. Ah, Again, maybe we could end on that note. That's really good. I, you know, maybe you listeners, I don't know how much you're taking away from this. This has been a, a personal growth experience for me in this conversation. Okay. So, and I'm relating this again to my personal life, but the, the focus on proactivity, putting out there the, the I mean, you talk about the, the vibrating on the same level, that energy, putting out the energy that, that you want in return. And, and if the response isn't there, you move on to the next person you know what you're looking for. You're putting that out there and you want to connect with people that are in the same wavelength. And it's as simple as that. And instead of getting bogged down by those interactions that aren't necessarily positive, you just jump to the next one and continue that proactive mentality. And man, this is, this is really good reminder for all of us. Okay. So follow up networking events. Uh, the next one is personal interaction. And and we kind of touched on this idea already, but what comes to mind when we talk about going beyond that surface level, kind of business interaction, exchange of business cards, how do you make things more personal? For sure. You know, for me, I just, I care about people, you know, and I want to surround myself with interesting people. So, you know, when I, when I'm meeting someone new and, and we just kind of start connecting and if there's like, you know, maybe like, maybe they're surfers or maybe they have kids the same age, or maybe it's whatever the things I'm always looking for the things that unite us over the things that divide us. And when those things like really overlap, properly then that's that's the building block of of creating relationships you know so i'll follow up with friends even if i just met them maybe i was at a recent networking event i met a guy whose son surfs and he had like a contest coming up so i that was the first time i'd ever met him two weeks later i was like oh hey how did your son do in that contest that's so awesome nothing about business whatsoever it was truly just interested in what they have going on because you know if we have shared interests i'm going to be interested in that regardless of work yeah, so looking for that the commonality, I think that's that's an interesting. I mean, even when you were talking about the people that don't necessarily respond in the same wavelength to you, one of the challenges even in that scenario is to figure out something that you can uh, both relate on. I mean, I've learned this even as a as a podcast host, you know, because it, you're a pretty natural conversationalist, Chris. But I've had a variety of guests on the show, and sometimes I have to carry the weight of the conversation a little bit more. And, and I enjoy that challenge. I want to be a better conversationalist. I want to learn how to draw people in, but a lot of that interaction, creating a good interaction does come down to finding commonality. And even if it's a small one, it may create conversation and you can use that as a starting place and, and create additional conversation from there. So that's, that's really good. I know that you mentioned to me, even making the effort to follow up on individual birthdays. Uh, You know, it's so easy in this day and age with Facebook platform, for example, you get that reminder from Facebook, oh, so-and-so has a birthday and you just fill in the blank and send them a birthday message. And so many people do that, but it, honestly, it feels so meaningless because you know it takes no effort. But you said to me that yeah. you, you make the time to call or at least send a personal text message to the individual on their birthday, right? Oh, for sure. Like, you know, I definitely, at the very minimum, shoot them a text. You know, a lot of times, um, you know, because we're all working like professionals and, and on Maui, everyone works so much. So at least a text, hey, happy birthday, have a great day. Hope everything is awesome. You know, and then if, if I know that they're off, I'll give them a phone call send them cards when I have time, but you know, just personal efforts. I feel like as much as as social media helps so many other aspects of relationships of maybe introductions to relationships, nothing can replace as you taking the time and shooting them a direct message on your phone, text, phone call or card. And that's super important. Ah, that's good. Okay. So follow up networking events, personal interaction, uh, or an effort at personal connection. And then the next one was ongoing communication that you mentioned to me. Talk to me about ongoing communication. Yeah. So one thing I've been trying to do more lately is before I send my galleries to my clients, and this is what I'm working with my high level planners. I'm going to tell my planner first, Hey, the, the gallery is ready. If you want to shoot them a message too, and maybe host some kind of event for them or, or just any sort of extra added service. Cause I really believe that our service carries far beyond past the wedding date. 
So everything I can try to do to continue that service thread throughout for carry that service on as long as possible really works for me. So I'll be following up with my planners. I'm about to send the gallery. You might want to give them a call in a couple of days and just follow up with them as well. And they so appreciate that because again, it elevates their service, you know, beyond just the wedding day, which is so important for all of us. Well, and this is a, a great segue into another point that you made earlier to me, which was the significance of adding value and I mean, we could have really put this at the very forefront. This is something, I mean, I even mentioned this to you about the podcast. My goal and number one goal with with Boca is to add value. I want to make sure that our listeners are walking away with something of value. And you've been a man, a massive value add to our listeners today. So I appreciate that. But you. when you talk about setting, not only, of course, d- doing this ongoing c- communication, the significance of that for the sake of your client's experience with your business, but also for the sake of their experience with these other businesses, a coordinator's business, for example. I love that focus on adding value. What else comes to mind when you talk about adding value? Sure. So, I, you know, for example, I just, with the Haiku Mill, I just reached out to them, said, hey, if you guys need new team shots, I'm happy to help. Let me know. So they took me up on it. I shot new head shots for, for the team there. And, you know, it cost me nothing, a little bit of time. I get to go hang out with people who are already my friends. So that's fun. And then take their pictures, have some great conversation, and then provide something back to them that they're going to be able to use in their business and then also promote through their website. So, again, it just it creates this circle, this, this everlasting circle. you know. And on a wedding day, when I shoot that beautiful picture of the bouquet, I send it to my florist friend. She's able to book more work. When I, you know, Every element of the day I photograph that's been provided by one of my, one of my frienders, I know that that image can potentially help them make more money and feed their family and keep the roof over their head. So again, it's really is this cycle and this whole circle of just like, how can I make sure everyone can share the rising tide lifts all ships, you know? So the more exposure my work gets, the more exposure their work gets, we all do better. Yeah, all do better. Yeah. And, and as cliche as that phrase, the rising tide lifts all ships. I mean, as, as cliche as that may seem, if you actually put it's it, so true. yeah, if, if you actually put it into practice, my goodness, the difference it can make in our businesses is just amazing. Let's end on um, what has been a theme in this conversation today. And again, I appreciate your example on multiple levels, Chris. This has been exhilarating for me, uh, truly. But you mentioned to me earlier gratitude. We have follow-up networking events, personal interaction uh, or personal connection, ongoing communication, the significance of adding value, and then gratitude. Talk to me about gratitude and how that plays a role in developing these relationships. So gratitude is the single most important word in my life. You know, I've, I've worked countless restaurant jobs. I've done a lot of different things. And for me to create this life I have now, I'm so grateful for it. You know, I'm so grateful for the, those key players I mentioned earlier that help, you know, to jet ski assist me into those first, those first big waves. I'm so grateful for the clients that see my work and that resonate with me and want me to spend the day with them. I'm so grateful for all my fellow vendors that provide such stellar work for me to photograph. And for me, I just, it's such a place where like, we're not promised tomorrow, anything can happen. So every day really is a gift. And the fact that I get to go like, you know, sometimes a hundred times a year and get to go to these amazing parties and capture these amazing couples in love and all this beautiful work people have created. It, it's re- it, and the only word is pure gratitude. Mm. I'm just so thankful for it. It's, it's amazing. Wow. Well, that's a wonderful way to finish our conversation. I really, speaking of gratitude, I can't thank you enough for making time to do the podcast today. Yeah. Will you just share in closing one more time where our listeners can find you online, kind of follow what you're doing? For sure. So chrisjevans.com is my main website. Chris J. Evans photo is my Instagram and my newest venture is the Santa Barbara wedding company.com. And you can find that at either S B Wedco. If you want the short version or Santa Barbara wedding company. If you want to really work your fingers on the keyboard.com, <laughs> both of those. And that's going to be my main associate program for Hawaii and Santa Barbara. Wow. That's awesome. Good for you. Congratulations. And um, thank you again for all of this. This has been a really lovely conversation. Lots to take away and go do with immediately. I mean, even even today, this was kind of something that was on my mind, the significance of doing. 
because I've I've had recent experiences personally where I realized, you know, if you sit back and and just dwell on things and overthink things and over process things, you miss out on opportunity. I love the theme, Chris, that you've you're maintaining that you're implementing in your life and your business of proactivity and setting the tone uh, for the life and the business that you want. Thank you for that example. And thanks again for making time for Boca. Well, Nathan, I couldn't appreciate it more, man. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful for you and um, look forward to more uh, conversations in the future. Definitely. Thank you so much for listening to the Boca podcast. Will you let us know what you thought by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca Podcast is brought to you by Milu, the simplest way for photographers and coordinators to collaborate on shot lists and timelines for weddings, parties, and other amazing events. Visit milu, M-I-I-L-U dot com. This podcast is also brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the professional photographer. Visit photographersedit.com.